Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for another very special edition of Wows Alive with our host, Ned Dennison. Ned? Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce a, a friend of mine, Gary Emich. He's an accomplished marathon swimmer. He's an author and a coach. And uh, for today, probably most interesting, he's one of the few people in the world that's done more than 1,000 Alcatraz swims. Gary, say hello to everybody. Hi there. So glad to be with everyone today. Gary, bring us back to your first Alcatraz swim and, and how it all came about. Yeah, I, I remember that vividly. Uh, it was May 15th, 2003, and it was part of a commercial event called the Alcatraz Shark Fest. And in talking to the race director beforehand, he said, yeah, there's sharks in there, but little did I know that there are five species of sharks in the bay, but they don't care about human beings. I only found that out later. And little did I know that the great whites just do not come in San Francisco Bay. So uh, for the first three weeks leading up to that event, I was just on pins and needles. I couldn't sleep. I just had trouble focusing on anything because I was so nervous. And you know, finally, when the day came and I jumped in the water, I settled in and everything seemed to be going all right. And I didn't know diddly squat about the strong currents in San Francisco Bay. And to make it back to shore, uh, you had to swim into uh, what they, what is called aquatic park. And from the bay into aquatic park, there's an opening maybe 50 yards wide. And I got a couple of hundred yards away from the opening and I said, okay, well, I'm going to swim right towards the opening. And as I did that, the currents just swept me right by. And uh, that happened to quite a few people. And in fact, there were four of us that globbed onto a kayaker to try to get us to move back to the, or take us back to the opening. And because of the weight, we all just started drifting with the current. And he said, we have to get off, go swim under the pier, uh, which is on one side of the opening and a boat will come by to get you in just a few moments. So, you know, like good little lambs, we all swam underneath the pier and we're hanging on and we waited and we waited and there's no boat coming and finally realized the only way to get back into aquatic park is to clamber over the underside of the pier, which was completely covered in barnacles and, uh, you know, bloodied and cut up, we got in and, I just realized at that point in time, uh, I've got some unfinished business here. So that, that was my very first one. And like I said, I just remember it clear as yesterday. Uh, do us a favor, Gary. There, there might be somebody in the world that doesn't actually know what Alcatraz is. Uh, tell us where it is, what it is, the distance of the swim, and give us some idea of these uh, currents you talk about, how, how strong they can get. So Alcatraz is an island that's uh, located about uh, two kilometers or one and a quarter mile off the shore of San Francisco. And uh, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was actually an army prison. And then in the early 30s, the army abandoned it and they turned it into a federal penitentiary. So uh, they sent all the hardened criminals there because uh, they just realized that uh, because of the currents and the sharks, quote unquote, and the uh, cold water that nobody would ever be able to escape. And the currents that I'm talking about, they really, really can run extremely fast. Um, if I can just give an example, uh, there was one time on the eastern side of uh, San Francisco, there's called the Bay Bridge, and it leads over to Oakland. And then on the west side of Alcatraz uh, in San Francisco, there's the Golden Gate Bridge, and that's a distance of about seven miles. And one time we picked out a very strong outgoing current, and we started at the Bay Bridge, swam to Alcatraz, and swam out to the Golden Gate Bridge. So seven miles that we swam, and it took us 79 minutes, which is about 11 minute miles. I mean, we were just, we didn't really have to do a whole lot except, you know, just swim and enjoy the free ride. So those currents are just exceptionally strong. 
And in a in a normal or uh, uh, sorry, if if I look across your thousand Alcatraz swims, what's your kind of normal time or range of times to get from the island into shore? You know that I always when people ask me that I always say you know that's the wrong question. You ought to ask what the currents are doing because my quickest crossing was twenty one minutes, and my longest crossing was an hour thirty eight minutes. So I mean it's just. I mean, it's just amazing. Having said those two extremes though, normally if you time the currents properly, and we always like to do science experiments out there, which is why, you know, the times vary so much. But if you pick an ideal time, it should take, you know, 40 to 50 minutes. I, I remember uh, the, the first set of directions I received on the big boat out near Alcatraz. And somebody kind of pointed yeah, kind of uh, 10 degrees to the to the left and said, if you're particularly fast, head this way. And they just kept moving their arm to the left and said, if you're really, really slow, you want to head out at about a 45 degree angle. And it was it was quite a dramatic kind of difference between a short, short crossing and something you're going to take a little bit longer. Did, did you get, um, so after you went back and did the second one, hopefully without drawing too much blood, were you instantly hooked or were you, you did you need to do another 10 or 12 swims before it kind of got in your blood? Well, you know, at the beginning, I didn't really have any goals at all. I just, uh, you know, swam the Alcatraz as, as the opportunities arose. And then I guess it was around 1995, I was 45 or thereabouts. My wife and I were at Yosemite National Park and there's a great big two or 3,000 foot vertical uh, cliff there called El Capitan and the guide who was taking us on the you know nature walk said that he had scaled El Capitan 50 times and then he decided he had pushed the boundaries enough and I was just sitting there and, and bink in the back of my brain I thought well I've done Alcatraz seven or eight times maybe it's possible that I can get up to 50 Alcatrazes by the time I'm 60 which was still you know 15 years away and I thought well man, I've only done 10 or so in the last couple of years to get to 50. That's going to be quite a stretch. And that was when the seeds sort of got it planted that uh, I could could possibly get up there. Um, a big part of your Alcatraz is the um, is the South End Rowing Club. Uh, tell us a little bit about the club and, and, and how you managed to get a membership there. Uh, well, the, the standard jokes are... Uh, the South End Rowing Club is a drinking club with a swimming problem. And the other one is that there's a rival club right next door, the Dolphin Club. And the difference between the two clubs is the Dolphin Club has rules and obeys them, and we just have rules. So it's a pretty loose group of people. We really like to, uh, you know, just experience life as it is. And I guess the way I got hooked up with it, I was uh, back in 1983, I was in uh, San Francisco on a work detail from Washington, DC. And I happened to be down at Aquatic Park, which is um, on the waterfront. And I saw these people swimming in the water. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. I love to swim. And I went down there and stuck my, you know, foot in the water just to get an idea of, you know, what the water temperature was. And my immediate reaction is, oh my God, these people are raving lunatics. And before I even got that thought processed in my brain, it was immediately followed up, but you know, you have to try it. So when I finally came out here on, uh, for a full-time position, uh, I went ahead and joined the South End Rowing Club and I've been a member now for going on 25 years. You, you retired a couple of years ago. Be, before retirement, Gary, describe to us your kind of typical week and, and how, how, how much of that involved the South End Rowing Club and how much of that involved Alcatraz. Well, before I retired in the uh, beginning of 2006, what I try to do is I always like to try to have a routine. So I try to swim down at Aquatic Park, uh, you know, three times a week. And then run off to work. Sorry, Gary, the, the volume's gone really, really low. Can you start that again, please? Yeah, so um, better. Before, 
okay, before I retired, what I try to do is um, I, I really like routine. So I try to swim three days a week before I went to work and uh, at the South End Rowing Club. And then on weekends, I, you know, go for a run and a bike. I was doing, you know, many triathlons at the time. And, uh, you know, you just really develop a camaraderie with all the people that are at the club. There's a group called the Sunrisers and it's toes in the water every day at 6.30 and that way everybody can get in a 30, 60 minute swim, take a warm shower and, you know, sauna and then scurry off to work. So that just really became an integral part of my life. And the the uh, the Alcatraz swims. Um, some people are familiar with the the big ferry that goes out with seven hundred people, but uh, uh, the vast majority of your swims were small groups with um, small zodiac boats. How how did that work? Basically, what would happen is uh, the Sunriser swims that I had just mentioned. Sometimes we'd take out uh, you know the rigid inflatable the little zodiacs. And we'd do a swim along the shore, or if the tides were right, uh, we would go out to Alcatraz and then swim Alcatraz in the morning. And there was a hardcore group of us uh, that finally decided, well, we all were pilots, we all could pilot. And we decided that we would form what we call the Alcatraz Swimming Society, or as we irreverently referred to ourselves as the asses. And uh, every Wednesday, uh, it was our Ash Wednesday, Ass Wednesday. We'd uh, head out to Alcatraz, and we just started doing Alcatraz every single Wednesday, uh, come rain or shine. And um, so, on these Wednesdays, you would have faced all variety of, of currents. If you went uh, thirty minutes before high or low water, you probably had a pretty quick swim. But if you went when the current was raging, how did you manage that? Well, what we you know, traditionally, uh, I've mentioned aquatic park several times, you know, the, the commercial swims normally go from Alcatraz back into aquatic park where the two uh, swimming and rowing clubs are. But when we realized that tides always aren't the same every single Wednesday, we started uh, devising new routes. And those, those were those science experiments that I alluded to. We thought, well, this is what the current's doing. Maybe we can swim from Alcatraz to this point on the shore or Maybe we can swim from the shore out to Alcatraz. And, uh, you know, we got skunked a fair amount of times. But, you know, after you've done the same route, you know, three or four times, uh, you start having a good idea of what you can or what you cannot do. And I also have kept a meticulous log. So, you know, if we were going to do a swim, I could go back and look at the log and see what the tidal conditions were. And we could, you know, have a fairly good uh you know idea of what the currents were going to do to us and this hardcore group is this the group that ended up starting what's called the centurion club the hundred alcatraz swim club uh, well no that was uh, something just a little bit different there sorry you've gone soft again gary okay so there uh hold on one second here that's okay it's, it's better now so the centurions were actually uh the brainchild of uh, one of the commercial race directors and he puts on a commercial swim every year it's called the swim with the centurions and you know the first couple of years that he had that swim you know a lot of us that had more than 100 alcatraz swims uh you know were invited there but that's sort of gone by the wayside so he still has the swim with the swim centurions but uh i don't know of a whole lot of centurions that are participating in the swim so um did you did you have a big celebration when you hit 250 and 500 swims and and uh, kind of what years were those yeah so actually um my fellow swimmer pedro or dennis uh and i sort of had our competition going to get to 100 uh i was sitting in the sauna one day after a swim and from the sauna we had a clear view out uh, out of a window to alcatraz and you know i just mentioned out loud you know at, at some point in time somebody's going to get to 100 alcatraz swims and it'd be nice to maybe have a certificate or something for them 
And I just saw that vink go on in Pedro's eyes. And I think that's where the whole thing with the Centurions came about. So he decided he was going to be the first to get to 100. And I decided, oh, no, you're not. I'm going to be right there. <laughs> and, you know, we could either kill each other trying to get ahead or we could develop a, you know, a gentleman's agreement that we'd both do an Al 100 Alcatrazes uh, together at the same time. And so that's what happened. And so that was... Uh, June 11th, 2001, which coincidentally was the 39th anniversary of the Anglin brothers and, and Frank Morris escape. And yeah, there was a big celebration. The TV cameras turned out. We got a great big uh, boat so everybody could come out and watch. And, you know, the, it was really supported by, you know, the South End Rowing Club. So it was quite a, a festive uh, time. And then uh, exactly Six years later, uh, Pedro and I, and by this time, another guy by the name of Stephen Hurwitz had joined in the, the chase and we were running up to 500. So we also did that on June 11th, uh, again, the anniversary. And so that was uh, between 2001 and 2007. That was six years, we did 400 Alcatrazes in six years and then i was ready to stop i thought well 500 is a nice number and stephen uh, yeah, said no we're we're not ready to quit we're going to run this up to a thousand and we we basically burned pedro out so you know we left pedro in the dust and stephen and i just kept dueling it out and dueling it out and 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 then in the subsequent uh, six years in 2013 and again finally on june 11th uh Stephen and I both did our 1,000th crossing together. So that was 500 crossings in, in six years. So that was, uh, we, were, we were just cranking them out. Every time we had an opportunity, we were down there swimming Alcatraz, you know, sometimes two, three times a week. Tell us about some of the more memorable swims. Um, also introduce people to the concept of the bump and run. Um, yeah, so um, there's uh, two kind of swims. A bump and a run is basically when you start at the shoreline of San Francisco and swim out to Alcatraz and then swim back to shore. There's also a round trip Alcatraz where you swim out and around the backside of Alcatraz and then come on back. And I think one of my most memorable swims uh, was I was doing a round trip Alcatraz. And so I had gone around the backside of Alcatraz and I was coming around the front and you can really get kind of spread out. And I was all by myself and, you know, you sort of zone out while you're swimming. And all of a sudden I saw this black torpedo shape just zoom under me. And it was like, whoa, what the holy heck was that? And before I could even, you know, stop to really process what I had just seen, it zipped underneath me again. And I thought, oh my God, I'm I'm shark buffet here. And so I started looking around wildly for a pilot to, to flag down and there's nobody in sight. You know, the nearest pilots, you know, a couple hundred yards off and I am just really panicking and I curled my knees up below me and tried to get into a tight little ball. And then all of a sudden about six feet in front of me, a little baby sea lion just breached in front of me. And so it was, you know, instant terror to polarity within the split second. So that was that was one very memorable one. Um, I think another one was uh, uh, Christine Buckley, a very dear friend, and she's only one of three people who has uh, gotten a thousand Alcatrazes too. We decided we were going to escape from Alcatraz in all four directions in one day. So you know, very first thing in the morning, we swam to uh, this island that's east of Alcatraz called Treasure Island. And then we waited for the tide to change. And then on the north side of Alcatraz is a large island called Angel Island. And we swam to Angel Island. And then we, you know, hung out and waited till the tide turned again and swam from Alcatraz to the Golden Gate Bridge waited for the tide to change again and finally swam from Alcatraz back to Aquatic Park. So 
uh, all four directions in one day. It was probably close to about 10 miles we chalked up that day. So that was, that was a very good one. But I think my very favorite one is uh, going back to Stephen Hurwitz and myself. Uh, we used to dress, we, we always knew we were gonna go to a thousand uh, together on the same day, but we just loved to drive ourselves and each other crazy by seeing who could always be ahead in the count. And so we, we would torment and tease each other. Uh, and one you know, time Stephen said, well, I'm going on vacation for uh, you know, two weeks, but I'm 10 ahead of you right now. So you know, I, I don't have anything to worry about. And that just stuck in my craw the wrong way. So with the local pilot, I made a deal where uh, he would take us out. And in the space of 10 days, we did eight bump and runs. And so each that each bump and run counts as two crossings because you swim out, you swim back. So when Steven got back, he found out that not only was he still not ahead, but he was six behind and he was so furious. I mean, it, it, it temporarily put a strain on, on our relationship. And But then he realized, well, you know what? Gary's always out of town traveling and, you know, leading swim trek uh, tricks. So, you know, when he goes out of town, I'm going to give it back to him in, in spades. So, you know, we just had that going for years, just tormenting the holy moly out of each other. I think for uh, this concept of the bump and run, so, so people get uh, can picture it in their mind. Uh, I think the, the last bump and run I did is we got in the little boat, went out of aquatic park, headed off to the right, went down, I don't know, two and a half, three miles or something. Had a lovely swim over to Alcatraz. You, apparently you're not supposed to touch it, but you can kind of stand on a rock and pretend you're going to touch it. And then when we headed back, we ended up about a mile from the Golden Gate Bridge. So the, the current had taken us the better part of five miles in that in that bump and run. And you just, you just get this impression of how insignificant you are in water moving that fast. It, and that's exactly right. And sometimes, uh, even though you know what the current's doing, you see the point of land where you thought you were going to get out, and you're still a third of a mile, a half of a mile offshore as you're being pressed, you know, swept by it. And it was that same sinking feeling of despair that I had the very first swim when I got swept past the opening to Aquatic Park and you realize, oh, I'm going to be in the water a heck of a lot longer than I planned. But yeah, that current is very, very powerful. So I heard a story, Gary, about you getting a ticket one time on a bump and run to Alcatraz. Um, did they, you know, did they, the warden come down and pick up your goggles and stick a paper in between your goggles Did they tuck it in the back of your swimsuit? What did you what did you get a ticket for and what and what did you do with it? Uh, well, again, this was uh, sorry, you've gone soft again. Okay, this was another misadventure uh, with Christine Buckley. We had done a swim from uh, the shore out to Alcatraz, and it was a little bit later in the day. And as you had alluded to earlier, you're not supposed to uh, touch Alcatraz. Uh, there's a little rocky beach. Uh, at, at Alcatraz at one spot and we swam into there and we got out and right above us there was a ranger uh, leading a tour and he just saw us and he I guess he got furious that not only had we touched Alcatraz but we had climbed out onto the island and so he was so incensed that he could see the name of the pilot boat and he knew where that pilot boat was docked so he came in uh, off Alcatraz and wrote three tickets uh, to, to, to us. And one was um, engaging in a sport without a permit, which was untrue because we did have a permit. The other one was engaging in an unsafe activity, which is debatable. But the third one that just blew us all away was uh, we got a ticket for illegal landing of persons on Alcatraz. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is everybody always escapes from Alcatraz, but we got a ticket for illegally landing on Alcatraz. And the, the funny part about this is, is um, it was a federal ticket. So uh, when you have a federal ticket, you have to go to U.S. District Court and appear to, you know, have it, you know, settled. 
And you just don't get rid of those tickets. And I think in all of our lives, there's something that's happened that's always been a mystery as to what happened. And we kept waiting for a summons to appear in court, a summons to appear in court, a summons to appear in court. And it never arrived. And about a year or two later, I was doing a, a presentation on swimming from Alcatraz. And one of the people in the back of the audience, you know, I was relating the story and he said, well, I can tell you what happened. He said, I was working, uh, interning in the U.S. Attorney's uh, office that summer when that uh, ticket came through and the lead U.S. Attorney just looked at it and said, oh, this is ridiculous. And he just crumpled them up and threw them away. So, I mean, that was the end of that. But are you still a felon? Uh, 20 arrests, but no convictions. <laughs> So let's say you and Steve uh, are, uh, are are heading off to a thousand. You uh, you're uh, taking a gauge of each other every now and then, making sure the other guy doesn't get too far ahead. Um, tell us about the plan to do a thousand. Presumably, you had a few friends along, and uh, you did a bit of a celebration afterwards. Yeah, actually, again, the the TV crews uh, turned out in force, and uh, we were just heavily supported with support boats and onlookers uh, from people from the South End Rowing Club. And of course, you know, our wives were out there because Steve and I we had gotten spent so much time together, we were calling each other girlfriends, uh, because <laughs> we were spending more time with each other than with our wives. So they came out. And after we had accomplished that, uh, we did have a celebratory party at the South End Rowing Club. And we also made it a fundraiser for, um, for three uh, nonprofits. One was uh, Baykeeper, who is an environmental watchdog agency who watches out over uh, the conditions in the Bay. The other one was Hospice by the Bay, which uh, Stephen had been involved with. And then of course, the third one was the South End Rowing Club. And uh, I, I also, indulge myself in a little bit of self-boasting uh, indulgence and got a big tattoo on the back of my back, on my left shoulder, uh, that has a picture of Alcatraz, a swimmer, and a shark following the swimmer. And it just says 1000, Alcatraz 1000. So that was my little bit of, you know, patting myself on the back for 20 years of chasing Alcatraz. And did you walk around without a shirt for a couple of months? Uh, no, I didn't. But there were a lot of people, you know, at the South End, you, you have abs get absolutely no respect. People wanted to know what was going to happen uh, when I got to 1,001. Was I going to have a magic <laughs> marker? Was it going to be like the old McDonald's signs that, you know, 100 million served, 200 million served? So, uh, you know, I, I did not walk around without my shirt. What are you up to now, Gary? Uh, 1,059. But, you know, after I got to 1,000, it was like, you know what? Because those last four years, we were doing over 100 a year. It's just like, you know, there's more to life than Alcatraz. And I remember very distinctly the, the first time after, uh, you know, the 1,000th Alcatraz, all I wanted to do was go in Aquatic Park and do just a very simple tame swim around the park and it just felt like a weight had been off my shoulder so uh, you know I, I was happy but I still get out there you know several times a year just to keep my hand in it is it is it Steve's fault if Steve had announced he was going to 1500 would it have motivated you well I think Steve actually is still sorry motivated. we lost you again you've gone quiet again okay I said Steve actually is motivated but I I'm not. So he's he's uh, kept on swimming, and I think he's up over 1,100 now. But you know, as I again, this goes back to our perpetual teasing of each other. I tell him that there were a couple hundred where he had rotator cuff issues, and he literally uh, couldn't swim, and he was kicking them with fins on. And I said, well, you know, you're. You're, those Alcatrazes don't count. Those are asterisks because you use fins. So that just sort of gets under his skin and makes him irritated, irritable. But, you know, if you think about it, still 
kicking them, you know, two kilometers, a mile and a quarter to with just fins and no use of arms. That's still pretty uh, amazing feat. Um, San Francisco, COVID, um, the club um, needed to shut for uh, some period of time. To describe what you're doing these days to, to stay in shape, how you're managing to swim, you're cycling, you're running. What's, what's life like? Well, the club still is uh, closed indefinitely, and we're not quite sure when it's going to be reopening, hopefully within the next year. Uh, and, and as you know, uh, from having visited, uh, I live three blocks from a surfing beach. And so what I've done with a handful of people from the club who live around here and a neighbor, we try to get down there on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays and splash in the water about eight o'clock, you know, weather conditions permitting. And normally once we get out past the the breaking waves and stay outside the surfers, you know, the water's, you know, pretty swimmable. And then, uh, you know, we'll be in a half an hour or so, uh, depending on the water temperature. And then we get out and, you know, I scurry home and take a nice hot shower. And I still try to get in, you know, at least one run and one bike a week, do a little Pilates, uh, do some strength training. I tore my rotator cuff last summer. So I've been working to you know, strengthen that up. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep my routine and, and stay healthy. Um, the, the mystique of Alcatraz lives large. I've, I've had a number of people that uh, are kind of more impressed I've swum from Alcatraz than the English Channel. Um, the, the, the famous escape with the two brothers and the other guy, um, Tell us a little bit about the, the, the story of that escape and uh, views of what might have happened. Well, it was uh, June 11th, 1962. Uh, two brothers, Clarence and James Anglin and Frank Morris, uh, made their escape out of the prison. And they had been working for months on end to scrape holes out of the back of their cells and they created masks out of paper mache and real hair and put those in the bed. So if a guard came by, it would look like they were sleeping and they snuck on up to the roof where they came out the top of a, a fan covering. And over the preceding months, they had built uh, a raft out of raincoats and they took off in the middle of the night and were never seen again. And you know, the, the conjecture just goes, you know, both ways. They all drowned and the other party says, no, nope, they, they survived and made it. And I personally think that they made it because uh, every year along the coast in the Pacific Ocean or even in San Francisco Bay, you know, one or two people drowns and their bodies sink. And then after uh, you know, a couple of weeks as the bodies start decomposing, the, the gases causes the bodies to rise again. And with the case of the escape, the Anglin brothers and Frank Morris, they had almost a 24-7 uh, search for those three guys uh, for almost two weeks, and they never found any bodies. They found a little bit of uh, debris from uh, the boats, but they never found any body. So I just think it highly unusual that all three would have drowned and not one of them would have surfaced back to the top again. And then about, about 10 years ago, there started to be rumors and photographic evidence that they had escaped and made their way down to Brazil. And there was a photograph circulating that showed uh, the two Anglin brothers. And then a year or two later, the FBI got a letter from the one uh, Anglin brother saying, you know, yeah, I, we did escape. Uh, I have terminal cancer. Uh, I would like to turn myself in if I can get some medical help. And that, that, that just never came to be. So I, it's an unclosed uh, chapter uh, of what actually happened. But, you know, my guess is that they did make it. But for, uh, for people listening, um, Alcatraz was for very, very hardened criminals. Uh, as a general rule, they wouldn't have grown up in a country club life learning how to swim in a, in a, in a little pool. 
Um, they were in Alcatraz, locked in a prison. They didn't get a lot of swimming exercise while they were there. The currents are savage. Um, and the ability to escape the prison alone was tough enough. So you just have to picture at some point, you know, somebody ends up in the water, probably unaware of what the currents are doing at that given time. Impossible to have arranged for somebody to meet you ahead of time. So really quite a quite an incredible story. Um, I, I guess the, um, the the final thing is I want to I, I want to add a little more danger into the into the story of Alcatraz. Um, okay. Uh, you, you you've had the occasional uh, sea lion nips in the aquatic park for the last few years. Not necessarily you, but others. Yeah. The, there's there's two type of. Uh, encounters with the, the marine life. Uh, the little seals, the harbor seals, when they're pups, they're just very playful and they come up and they'll nudge you while you're swimming. And of course, then it's just amazing you defy gravity. You're five feet out of the water and go, what the heck was that? And then the big mistake that everybody makes when those little playful sea, uh, seal pups hit you is, they start swimming like all get out to get away. And that's just like running away from a dog. If you start running away from a dog, the dog's just going to follow you. And you know what? That's exactly what the you know little pups want you to do because they want to play. And so the couple of times that I've been bumped by the pups, I just refuse to move. And they'll come up within three feet of, uh, of me and sort of look at me and go like, well, what's wrong? You're supposed to be running away from me. So, you know, that's one, one part of it. But then there's also the sea lions, uh, and they get up to, you know, 1,500 pounds, and they can get kind of grouchy, uh, especially during mating time. And there have been any number of people who have, uh, you know, gotten some pretty serious bites uh, from the sea lions. Uh, but that is a very infrequent uh, occurrence, you know, maybe in the 25 years that I've been a member of the club, there are have maybe only been a half dozen bites. So it's just not something that you have to worry about. And then I have to correct you on the great whites in, um, in San Francisco Bay. Um, while it's quite clear, it's, it's, it's very unusual for great whites to be in there. There was a classic piece of YouTube footage a couple of years about, about some young kid from the East Coast who wasn't very happy about being on uh, vacation in San Francisco and they were on the Alcatraz tour and he was filming as they were leaving, grumbling about a stupid prison tour, stupid prison tour. And a great white took a seal right at the pier where they were loading on the boat. And he got uh, some great footage and a lot of blood. And he turned from a really unhappy kid into a kid that had the greatest experience of his entire life. I'm sure and about, it was. And, and, and I remember that incident, yeah. And about three days later, we did a bump and run and um, did the turn kind of near that pier. <laughs> We, we did, and you know, we, we the sauna time and after our swims is a great time for discussion. And what we finally concluded was uh, shark great whites are visual hunters. And that particular year, there was hardly any rain runoff from all the tributaries that flow into the bay. So the water was just exceptionally clear that year. And that's why uh, the this particular great white had ventured in. The, the reason we don't worry too much about it is uh, about a third of a mile east of Aquatic Park in the South End Rowing Club is where all the sea lions hang out. And, and that's, I mean, that's the food that uh, shark great whites feed on. So, you know, if they were in there on a continuing basis, uh, they would be all over Aquatic Park and, and Fisherman's Wharf where those sea lions are. But uh, because the water's normally so murky that you can't see past your fingertips. So that's why they stay out uh, in the ocean where the water's a lot clearer. Gary, I want to thank you very much for your time today. I think everybody who um, does much in the open water can, can relate to the uh, concept of kind of having no goal and drifting along, and then all of a sudden latching on the goal. And this, uh, this battle for you know, two or three people to see you know, who's going to be one ahead or a little bit faster or something. It's, it's a classic in our sport. It's one of the great things about the sport. So thank you very much for sharing that. So just one last thing, uh, you know, when I look back at it, I mean, compared to what some of the swimmers such as yourself have accomplished, I mean, you know, swimming from Alcatraz itself isn't that big of a deal because it's a, you know, 
two kilometer, two and a half kilometer swim, depending on what the currents is, but it took me 20 years to get to a thousand Alcatrazes. So if you average that out, that's almost like one a week for 20 years. So, you know, if anything, I guess I can't do the longer swims, but at least I've got the perseverance. You, you had some longer swims in your, in your career, Gary. Don't, don't, don't undersell yourself. Thanks again, man. Thank you. Take care.